yes, as I started to mention, uh, I'll be talking about two documents produced by the NFPA that aren't really adopted and enforced by legislative bodies. Now, these are produced by the NFPA Committee on Cultural Resources, and Professor Ono already showed you a slide with their names, NFPA 909, Code for the Protection of Cultural Resources, uh, Libraries, Museums, and Places of Worship, and NFPA 914, Code for Fire Protection of Historic Structures. And even though they're not adopted by legislatures and enforced, they exist as educational documents and documents to be used by users if they want to protect their properties in a reasonable and, and, and professional manner. I should mention that the Committee on Cultural Resources, unlike most committees of the NFPA, is truly an international committee. And by that, I mean not only do they have representatives from other countries on the committee, but they regularly meet outside North America. Uh, they are what I consider the NFPA's ambassadors of goodwill. They visit various countries, visit historical sites and uh, cultural resources, and often conduct seminars in conjunction uh, with uh, groups in other countries. I'm sure they'd come uh, to Brazil if they were invited, and you can provide them with a, a meeting room in a nearby hotel, they'd be all set. And uh, uh, they learn from these trips. For example, here's a uh, a meeting of the committee that took place at the uh, at a basilica in uh, L'Aquila, Italy in 2003. Uh, you can see me there, I'm the third from the left. And the reason I show this picture, you know, was that the same building was damaged six years later in an earthquake. Uh, Italy has earthquakes. Italy had a, a bad uh, earthquake this week. And uh, it, it brings to mind the fact that the committee is aware not only of the fire protection issues, but other issues as well. Now, the NFPA committee itself is balanced, as I talked about yesterday. Uh, there are manufacturers and installers of different types of protection systems, insurers, engineers, consultants, uh, building and fire authorities, and user groups uh, from a number of institutions, such as the Smithsonian, the National Gallery of Art, uh, Historic Scotland, and uh, others because they are interested and they bring their expertise to the, the committee. Now one of the things you get as a committee member, and I've been a committee member of that group for about 20 years now, are regular reports on severe fires and other tragedies that befall uh, irreplaceable buildings and collections. I have uh, two of them shown here, a Windsor Castle fire in uh, England, one of the royal residences there, took place in 1992. And of course, if you ever want to find the non-combustible building, look for a castle. But that fire resulted in a damage of more than 50 million US dollars and a number of irreplaceable uh, collections that can't even be uh, valued. Uh, the fire on the right was the uh, Fenici uh, Opera House in Venice in 1996. And I put that one there because it's some, kind of ironic. Uh, that name really refers to the phoenix that rises from the ashes following a fire, and it was given to the opera house when it was first built because the old opera house burnt down and they were building a new opera house on a new piece of land. But since that time, this opera house has now burned at least three times and has to be rebuilt every time. Uh, so it's a, a problem that we don't learn all the time from our mistakes. And, and this really represents it. 909, the cultural resources document, uh, contains this statement. The governing body, so that would be the body in charge of using this document, is to adopt a protection plan to address fires, deliberate acts of third parties, staff or visitors, or other potentially adverse events involving weather, earthquakes, loss of communications, failure of critical building systems, flood, or loss of utilities. So you can see that this committee views itself as going beyond fire protection because they recognize that these important buildings and their important collections need to be preserved against all manner of hazards. So even though they're the NFPA committee and the F stands for fire, yes, uh, they view themselves as guardians of these cultural uh, resources. Now, the basic provisions of NFPA 909, it's either a prescriptive approach or a performance-based option. And remember, these are, are buildings largely that are to be built. 
when you're talking about the application of NFPA 909. And under the prescriptive approach, they would say, okay, provide a fire detection system as required by applicable codes, but also provide an automatic sprinkler or alternative automatic suppression system, even if it's not required by the codes, even if it's a small building that wouldn't, by the codes, require such a system. And they also want an electronic premises security system as required in the protection plan. Under the performance-based alternative, the building designer would be required to consider a number of different uh, fire scenarios and show how the building would perform, how, uh, what would happen if different types of fires were located in different parts of the facility. That's a, a true performance-based approach. Now, NFPA 914, on the other hand, which deals with historic structures, recognizes that these buildings were already built. And like many codes, it makes some concessions. It states here in section 4321, fire safety, fire protection features, and security measures shall be designed, approved, implemented, and maintained to preserve the original qualities or character of a building, structure, site, or environment. So they're very aware of the need for protection, but they have to balance that with their awareness of the need to preserve the character and quality of the historic property. Like NFPA 909, NFPA 914 has alternatives, but the prescriptive approach is a little uh, looser, let's say. It, it allows requirements of applicable codes to be modified if the application would clearly be impractical in the view of the HJ, that's the authority having jurisdiction, but only where it's also clearly evident that a reasonable degree of safety is provided. And when making this determination, automatic and or manual suppression systems are permitted to be considered as what they call compensatory features, things that can substitute for other provisions of the code. And in the performance-based option, it's very similar to NFPA 909, different types of fires positioned in different, type, different parts of the facility to make sure that uh, protection is maintained based on what you're providing. Now one of the key concerns when you're talking about fire protection equipment and all of these types of buildings is aesthetics. How will the systems look? Will they interfere with the optics and use of the building? These statements come out of the documents, uh, especially 914. You want to minimize alteration, destruction, or loss of historic fabric of the building. And that historic fabric is defined, as you see here, as original or added building or construction materials, features and finishes that existed during the period that is the most architecturally or historically significant or both. So yes, we want these buildings protected, but we want to take special care to make sure we're not damaging in any way, hopefully, the special character of these buildings. And this has been a concern for many years. On this slide, uh, I included uh, an, a, an old picture. The black and white is from a hotel in my native New Hampshire in the US where back in the old days, there weren't many options on how to put in a sprinkler system. And what they had done was hide it in plain sight. They made the pipe more ornamental, made it look like a curtain rod, and so it wouldn't detract from the character of the colonial period. Uh, you really can't tell much, but in the uh, blue, in that blue ceiling in the uh, National Indian Museum of the Smithsonian, uh, there is a concealed sprinkler. But of course, now the manufacturers are able to put cover plates on concealed sprinklers to any pattern or color uh, necessary. And so you can't even see the sprinkler in that ceiling. And there's actually uh, piping in the dark space up above the ceiling that you also can't see. And we have a you know, variety of concealed sprinklers, flat plate uh, uh, pendant and sidewalls that weren't available in the old days, which really make it much easier to provide a sprinkler system unobtrusively. These photos come from the US Library of Congress in Washington, DC, where sprinklers have been fit into each of these ceilings. And you'd be hard pressed to actually notice the sprinklers because they did a very careful job. In fact, the architect of the Capitol uh, has, over a number of years, made sure that all of our federal buildings of significance are protected with sprinkler systems from the White House to the, uh, uh, all the uh, congressional office buildings and so forth. 
Uh, up in the top left, this is a picture of the uh, palace in Vienna, the Schloss uh, Schönbrunn, where the NFPA committee has actually had a couple of meetings over the years. Uh, and directly below it, you can see a more conventional way of putting a sprinkler into a, a wall to protect the room. Well, one of the things they found over there was that they had areas where they didn't want or, or couldn't see the way to put sprinklers into the building. And they created what they called these purpose design service columns. I don't know if you can appreciate this, but these uh, green uh, glass or lucite type structures uh, have a sprinkler toward the top. So they, they bring these columns into the room, not to look like the room itself, but an accessory that provides some lighting as well as uh, fire protection for the facility. One of the uh, things that preservationists worry about, and this is a quote from a member of the NFPA committee who's been involved in a number of projects, uh, most lately putting water mist systems into some of the homes of ex-presidents, uh, like Thomas Jefferson's Monticello and James Madison's house. Uh, I'm quoting him here, because preservation standards, he's saying, uh, spring, because of those, sprinkler components should be reversible, able to be removed and replaced with better, currently unknown components in the future. And when you hear a panel like we heard on sprinkler technology, you recognize that what's coming down the road may not be what we're using right now. And so you want to make sure that you're not permanently changing the structure in the building if you don't have to. You want to be able to possibly remove the sprinkler system at one point in time in the future in favor of some other uh, form of system that will suppress or extinguish the fire. Now, in preparation for this conference, I looked at uh, the internet and world heritage sites in Brazil. And among the thousands of properties that are certainly important, uh, cultural resources and historic structures, are 13 cultural and seven natural sites recognized by UNESCO as world heritage sites. When I look at this list, I, I of course recognize Brasilia. I had the good fortune of being able to visit there uh, after the Kiss nightclub fire during some testimony. Uh, you're probably all more familiar with the rest of them than I am, but you notice that a lot of these are historic centers and, and town centers and such. And you might think, what can we do uh, if we're protecting buildings one by one, how can we provide uh, protection for some of these? And Victoria Valentine yesterday mentioned an IFSA project where uh, we assisted the Swedish Sprinkler Association in one of their projects. There was, in 2001, a whole block of the wooden center of one Swedish city lost to fire. And right after that, the Swedish Sprinkler Association installed rows of open sprinklers along the combustible street fronts in another historic city, places that were too narrow for the fire department vehicles, just like Professor Ono talked about. Now, these systems don't have automatic water supplies, but they have fire department connections into which the fire department can pump water from where they can get the fire trucks uh, to. So they can only get the trucks so close, and then they pump into these systems. And what's interesting, this work was done in 2001, 2002, but just last year, the, uh, those manual sprinkler systems were credited with helping to stop a fire in that historic district of the Swedish city, and uh, they were very pleased that it, it took 14 years, but that uh, the systems worked very well. In a similar vein, we had a fire in the United States in 2013, a place called Seaside Heights, New Jersey, an old boardwalk town, a lot of combustible construction. And as you can see in the top left there, a very big fire, most everything burned to the ground, but there were two buildings that actually were protected with exterior sprinkler systems, automatically activated exterior sprinkler systems. And uh, as you can see, that white building is standing after that massive fire because of the exterior sprinkler system that you can see uh, there. Now the, the vinyl siding melted, it got that hot, but the building itself was not damaged, nor was a, a similar building down the, the block. So these systems do work. And you know, we always think of sprinkler systems on the inside, but uh, historically, a lot of sprinkler systems were installed on the outsides of buildings, and it's a technology we should 
uh, keep in mind. And yes, I also have a, a slide from <laughs> Shira, Shira, uh, Kao's, Shira Kawa. Shira Kawa. Very good. Famous, famous uh, application of suppression systems. Let's go back to Brasilia for a second. The reason I like Brasilia so much is that I was born in 1952, so I was a school child when it was being built, and I remember reading a lot about Brasilia, uh, so I'm a fan. And that city has been designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site since 1987. One of the things I like are the smaller hotels in the hotel district, but uh, I, I note there's a story with the Brasilia Palace Hotel. This was opened in 1958 as uh, Neymar's second major building in the city, after the, uh, pal after the palace itself. And over the years it hosted Queen Elizabeth, Dwight Eisenhower, uh, Indira Gandhi, and others. Very famous hotel. Had a fire in 1978. I, I imagine a lot of you know about this in this room and sat empty for 30 years until it was uh, rebuilt and reopened in 2006. And it was interesting. I found the 1958 picture on the internet as well as uh, the current photo of that same mural area. And uh, I don't know if you can see it from where you're sitting, but the difference in those two pictures are sprinklers in the ceiling. So I found this very uh, encouraging. I went to the site and you can see pictures of sprinklers in a lot of their, their photos. Uh, so unlike that theater in Venice, a lesson was learned here. And they don't want to keep rebuilding it and rebuilding it and rebuilding it after fires. Uh, and they were able to uh, change the, the fate, hopefully, of that building. But hopefully it also extends beyond that one building because from what I read, when uh, Brasilia was made a UNESCO World Heritage Site, the federal government undertook certain commitments to protecting and preserving uh, the significant cultural aspects of the city. So I think there's an, uh, a real need to look at a lot of those historic properties there. As I say, I'm very partial to the small hotels that look like something the Jetsons or might have lived in. I don't know if that's a familiar term to you, but it was, it was sort of the idea of what will the future hotel look like? And so they built some of these, and they're still there, and I hope they stay there. They're very, uh, very interesting. And so that concludes my remark. Uh, I think uh, a lot of great progress is being made in this area of protecting our cultural heritage. Thank you.